Hello and welcome. This is Will Rems for Create the Learning Site, a place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. To summarize the message of the prophets in two words, is that possible? I think it is. It takes two short Hebrew words, one of which I'm sure you know. It also needs an additional concept and, okay, maybe a third word. But then we capture the heart of the matter. Such considerations make sense because many Bible readers quickly lose their way in the forest of biblical prophecies. The question arises, how can we help Bible readers to read the prophets with more understanding? Recently, I was asked to give an introduction to the prophetic books in the Bible in just over an hour. I tried to do this by addressing three aspects. So first, there is the role of the prophets. Second, there is the time of the prophets. And third, there is the message of the prophets. As I said, two words and a concept. I'm sharing my draft here in case you need to do something similar sometime. I hope it helps. I often approach the subject of the prophets in the following way. I first ask what the audience connects with the idea of a prophet. What comes to mind? Well, we'll often include things like they warn, they speak of judgment, but also of hope, they hear God, uh, they are called, uh, there's the Word of God, and any number of other things. When I have collected enough answers, my next question is, what of all this is essential? Well, I, I, I'd say it's especially this and this. Uh, and, and usually it's possible to work out that the prophets were essentially spokesperson or messengers of God. They conveyed his words and concerns. I follow up with two further questions. First, who was the first prophet in Israel? It's not too hard, the answer is Moses. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses refers to himself as a prophet. And in that chapter, he announces further prophets whom God will raise up. This leads to a second question. How many prophets do you think there were, say, between Moses and the exile? The answer is difficult for many. There are more than most people think. There must have been at least several thousand. After all, we're talking about 700 or 800 years, depending on the date of the Exodus. There were always prophets during this time. Especially in Kings and Chronicles, prophets are regularly mentioned. About most of them, we know very little. In some passages of scripture, it becomes evident that there were larger groups of prophets at the time in question. Both in 1 Samuel chapter 10, shown here, and in 1 Samuel chapter 19, Saul encounters a group of prophets. Both times he is overwhelmed by the presence of the Spirit in their midst. In 1 Kings 18, it is reported that Queen Jezebel, in verse 4, has been killing the prophets of the Lord, but at a certain Obadiah, who was over the king's household, hid and cared for 100 of these prophets. And then in the stories about Elijah and Elisha, there is repeated mention of what the literal translation is, the sons of the prophets, some of whom at least live in community. These sons of the prophets are sometimes understood as disciples of the prophets or even as a school of prophets. However, it is more likely that they are simply members of the prophetic community. Compare sons of Israel or daughters of Jerusalem. This would mean that in the northern kingdom, at least at the time of Elijah and Elisha, hundreds of prophets were active at the same time. Therefore, in eight centuries, there must have been thousands of prophets in Israel. In other words, the prophets formed a movement. 
one that was essential for Israel. The prophets were uncompromising in their commitment to the God of Israel. They kept the faith of Israel alive. Renewal often came through them. It's hard to imagine how Israel's faith would have survived the exile without them and their words. And at this point, one more question needs to be asked. How many prophetic books are there in the Old Testament? There are only 16 compared to some thousands of prophets. This means these books are only the tip of the iceberg. For the vast majority of the prophets, none of their words has been handed down. Only in the final phase, from about 150 years before the exile, were the words of individual prophets collected and handed down in writing. Why? The relationship between God and Israel had fallen into a deep crisis. It was at risk of collapse. It must have been increasingly clear that harsh consequences would follow. For this reason, the emphasis of the prophetic message shifts somewhat toward warning and confrontation. And in view of the coming exile, it must have seemed wise to put the message in writing so that it would not be lost. The prophets were not only God's mouthpiece, in this phase a second role emerged that increasingly appeared in the role of the accuser or prosecutor, law enforcement. There was a trial. The covenant, a formal agreement between God and the people, was not being kept. There was a breach of contract and the prophets brought charges. This explains why, for example, in Isaiah 1 and Micah 6, heaven and earth, hills and mountains are called upon as witnesses. They are expected to confirm the breaking of the covenant. The role of the prophets is thus that of spokesman and prosecutor. The resulting indictment and verdict can only be understood against the background of their time and the events of that time. Several prophetic books are explicitly anchored historically in their first verse, if for example Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1, and even if not, what the prophets say and write is historically conditioned. I keep this second section brief. I will not attempt to set out the history of the Old Testament here. Uh, a simple timeline, as shown next, can help to give an overview. The relationship crisis led to a double existential crisis. Uh, the first one here, uh, and the second one there. For Isaiah and his contemporaries, Micah, Hosea, Amos, and Jonah, uh, it was the Assyrians who brought this crisis about. Isaiah witnessed the end of Samaria and the Northern Kingdom around 722 BC and the invasion of Judah by Sennacherib in 701 BC. Now for Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Uh, it was, oops, the Babylonians who caused the crisis. In 586, they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and carried its people away into uh, captivity. Now, as foretold in the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 to 48, the Persian king Cyrus ended Babylon's world domination around 539 BC. He ordered the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its temple and this was followed by a time of uh, return and restoration for Israel, uh, accompanied by the prophets Zechariah, 
Haggai, and Malachi. In addition, Isaiah and Daniel also spoke of this time and far beyond. This brings us to the message of the prophets. It can be summed up in two Hebrew words. The first word is shuv, a simple verb much used in the Old Testament. In the context of the prophets, it is often translated as repent. But this is an unclear and abstract word. What does it mean to repent? How does one do that? The better translation, more literal, is to turn. A concrete and visual turn. The action has two sides. One turns away from something, in this case idols and injustice, and one turns towards something else, in this case God and righteousness. Repentance, turning, is the goal of the prophets. And then the, sec the second word is shallow, the one I'm sure you know. It sums up what God's future looks like. Restoration, peace, healing, justice, etc. In Isaiah, this theme takes up almost half the book. Shalom is the goal of, uh, is the goal of God and functions as a motivation for turning. Well, okay, perhaps a third word is necessary or useful, justice. Shalom is God's contribution. Righteousness, justice, is what God expects from Israel and from us. In addition, we need an idea, a concept that appears again and again in the prophets, the day of the Lord. It stands for God's intervention in history. The day has two sides. Uh, it is about judgment. But it is also about restoration. The coming time of salvation that is made possible by the day of the Lord. Uh, and that, uh, <coughs> may be summarized as shalom. The condition for participation in the restoration is the first word, shuv. Now it gets a little more complicated, where the picture is simple, but the fulfillment is not. There is not just one day of the Lord. We have, for instance, the plague of locusts and Joel. We have the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, the end of the Babylonian Empire, uh, 539 BC. And they're all referred to as the day of the Lord. In part then for the prophets, the day of the Lord is in the near future. And for us, therefore, it is in the past. But in part, it is about the distant future, the end, and the new world order that God will then establish. It becomes complicated, above all, because the prophet often mix these two, near and far, historical and final. We call this foreshortening. It is as if they do not perceive the time dimension or simply ignore it. Everything seems to happen more or less simultaneously within a short time period. We find a good example of foreshortening in the second half of Isaiah. There we read about Cyrus and the end of the exile, followed by the return and the rebuilding of the temple. There's also the suffering servant, for instance, in Isaiah 53, a prophetic image that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Beyond that, Isaiah talks about 
everything else God has in store. Glory and shalom, even new heavens and a new earth. One would not guess from the book of Isaiah, from reading Isaiah, that there are more than 500 years between Cyrus and the servant. Between the servant and the consummation, there is at least another 2,000 years. Now, at this point, it gets even more complicated because we are actually already living in the time of fulfillment. The future is no longer just future. It has already begun. Jesus says this to his disciples after the resurrection. Peace, shalom, be with you. The new creation already exists. And the eternal joy that follows salvation, Isaiah 35, is also not only future, but also already now and ours to experience. This makes the message of the prophets so relevant for today. Conversion or turning to God is still called for. It leads those who respond into the experience of salvation and glory and shalom announced by the prophets. I'll leave you with a quotation from First Peter to ponder.